not good. We're not happy about it at all. Not at all. We've let our position be known, and we're not happy about it. We, we do not like what's happening either way. We don't like what's happening, and hopefully it'll get straightened out. I know Europe is not... Uh, they are not thrilled. They're working on it, too. We're all working on it together. President Trump there talking about Russia's latest aggression against Ukraine. As you heard, he's not placing direct blame on Russia, and that puts him on an island yet again. That is, our European allies are universally condemning the Russians. Now, this all started when Russian ships opened fire on Ukrainian vessels and seized the ships. At least three Ukrainian sailors were injured. 24 were captured. The Russians say the Ukrainian boats violated its territorial waters when it entered a narrow strait near Crimea. This, the biggest flare-up since Russia annexed the Crimea from Ukraine 40 years ago. Now, Ukraine has declared martial law and the region is tense, to say the least. All this happening just days before President Trump's expected to see Vladimir Putin at the G20 meetings. It all begs the question. What is Putin's endgame and why make this move now? Matthew Schmidt, he's an associate professor of national security and political science at the University of New Haven. He was also a monitor for the national elections in Ukraine a few years ago. Matthew, as always, good seeing you. You too, Richard. Okay, um, first of all, put the significance uh, of this in context because uh, to declare martial law is in and of itself a significant step, but why are the Ukrainians so on edge, even more so than before? Well, I think the first thing to understand is that this is a classic shaping operation. So it's using military force, in a sense, on both sides in order to shape the political environment uh, in Ukraine. There's an upcoming presidential election in 2019. So as you said, I was there for the election in 2014 that elected Poroshenko, the current president. Uh, he's up for re-election in 2019, and it doesn't look good for him. Um, that's, that's number one. Number two, the audience needs to understand that martial law has only been declared in the regions uh, up against Russia, so along the border. It's not the entire country. The Ukrainian president did say he's worried about a land invasion. He calls it a very serious threat. Is that electioneering posturing, or do they really think the Russians could go that far? Uh, it's both. So any president has to say that and has to take that into account, however small the possibility. But I do think that the, the, the real risk of Russia uh, rolling tanks across the border is, is pretty uh, insignificant here. It would, it would trigger a huge international backlash, and it's not clear that it would change Russia's uh, strategic position in Ukraine. Again, what they're trying to do here primarily is shape the, uh, the political landscape for the upcoming election. Uh, putting tanks into Ukraine and that, with that kind of aggression is likely to uh, be counterproductive. Why now, though, Matt? I mean, you got the G20 coming up. Um, the president, obviously, has already talked about having a private side session with Putin. Why do this now and invite global condemnation right before you're going to be in front of those same world leaders? Uh, I think, uh, frankly, that the timing is because of the G20 and that what Putin is trying to do is put uh, President Trump in a position to essentially not condemn him, right, to give sort of a soft... Uh, a soft acknowledgement about the uh, the complexities and the rights of Putin to do this kind of thing. To that end, Matt, um, is it at this point beyond a debate that either the Russians, whether it's compromise, they read weakness, they read indifference, whatever it is, this just the last example of the president, as I said, standing on an island and basically letting Russia do what they want. Is it clear in Moscow right now that the president is not uh, going to be a problem for them. Uh, maybe the Congress might be with sanctions and the rest, but basically they will always get a free pass from Trump, and do they read it as such? Yes, I, I think uh, that, that Putin understands that President Trump will have to make certain actions in order to appear as though he is implementing sanctions, often when he's not. Um, actions that will push back. We may sortie our, our fleets into the Black Sea and kind of uh, show a force, that kind of thing. I could imagine that happening. Our, our training battalion in Ukraine might sort of step things up. But in the end, uh, Trump likes to keep his options open, and so he's going to back down. He's going to not put Putin in a corner, and in essence, Putin is going to be able to put him in a corner. So last question, Matthew, is the one I started off the interview with. What is the end game of Putin here? What is he really after? He's after, ultimately, control over the political environment in Ukraine. 
His, he does not want Ukraine to become part of the European Union. That's his great fear. He does not want Ukraine to become part of NATO. In order to prevent those things from happening, he needs to control who's getting elected in the presidential election in March and then in the parliamentary elections uh, later in the fall. And so this is an attempt to push Ukrainian public opinion to say, hey, we're, we're not into this war anymore. It's too much. We don't really care. Let's back off and, and sort of make a separate peace. Um, and, and that's really what he's trying to do and put in a, you know, pro-Russian candidates. Always uh, interesting. Matthew, I appreciate the time as always. Thank you so much. Well. And we'll be right back to wrap things up. Stay with us.